And in a moment, I'm going to hand straight over to, to Giovanna and Ashreen, who are going to take you along with um, the entire participation displacement working group to talk about the secret, the secret of measuring participation. So here is your chance to learn that secret. Aren't you glad you joined today? So without further ado, I will hand over to Giovanna, I think, to take us forward. Thanks, Giovanna. Uh, thanks, Charlie, and thanks everybody for uh, joining us today. So the first part of uh, the session will focus on uh, measuring participation. So during uh, uh, 2020, the working group members uh, identified monitoring and evaluation of uh, participatory process or participatory activities as one of the areas of uh, improvement. And uh, also they highlighted the need to have more uh, guidance and tools to guide us in measuring participation. So today we will try to um, understand the challenging and issues uh, related to measuring participation, but also we hope to explore some uh, existing tools that can be helpful when we want to monitor and evaluate uh, uh, participation of uh, community in our uh, CCM work. To do so, uh, we have with us uh, uh, some practitioners that will help us a bit uh, in the discussion. And uh, I will uh, ask um, our speakers to directly introduce themselves briefly. So we could uh, uh, start with uh, Kristen. Hello, everyone. Um, it's very nice to be here. My name is Kristin Westreim, and I work with NRC to support community coordination globally. Thank you. Michelle? Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Michelle Farrington. I'm the Public Health Promotion and Community Engagement Lead for Oxfam, sitting in the global humanitarian team. So I work within our, our WASH team. Um, but also we have a strong focus on community engagement. Dr. Ellie? Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me today. My name is Ellie Goldney, and I'm working with uh, Acted Syria as the CCCM Technical Coordinator. And Julia? Hello everyone, I'm Julia. I am an ME specialist supporting IOM HQ uh, in the Women's Participation Project. It's a pleasure to be here with you all. So thanks a lot, Christine, uh, Michelle, Ellie, and uh, Julia. Um, as you know, I mean, uh, please feel free, actually we encourage you to use the chat uh, throughout the session if you have uh, questions, uh, if you have comments, and if you have, uh, you know, any, any input. Uh, before going uh, into the depth of the discussion about uh, measuring participation, uh, we would like to start uh, having a look together uh, at how the CCM cluster uh, defines participation. So uh, community participation in CCM is defined as a process that requires planning and resources and where individual and groups from displaced community identify and express their own views and needs and where collective action is taken to significantly contribute to solution. This is a, a definition that we have uh, in the management toolkit in the chapter number three, the, ch the chapter dedicated to uh, community participation. So community participation is a process and is a process that uh, includes a number of different activities. So for um, for us, for CCM practitioners, these activities could be uh, related to the participation of uh, individual groups in the care and maintenance of the camps or of the sites, for example, or uh, could be the activities related to engagement, engaging groups and individuals in uh, uh, designing uh, uh, service provision. Or uh, another example, which I think it's very uh, important for us, for our work, it could be uh, all the activities of capacity building of representation structures and the activities uh, that we do to make sure that uh, representation, community representation structures are part of uh, coordination for our, or decision-making for us. 
But then uh, I would understand uh, if this process uh, that we're trying to facilitate, that we're trying to encourage is actually working. So how we uh, understand if uh, community actually managed to influence decision making, uh, decision making uh, with their views and with their priorities. And uh, how, I mean, and again, for us in particularly, how do we uh, understand uh, if uh, these community representation structures that we uh, support, that we invest uh, a lot of our energy uh, and activities are actually effective, they're actually accountable. Uh, how do we evaluate if uh, they play um, a key role in the decision-making with the other stakeholder? And uh, I, I feel that this is not, it's not only an issue about uh, measurement, and it's not only an issue about uh, uh, being able to uh, demonstrate to donors or to the other stakeholders the, the added value of uh, you know, the CCM work uh, uh, around participation, but it's also, uh, and maybe most importantly, about uh, uh, learning. So uh, uh, learning and uh, maybe also making mistakes and improving and above all asking uh, directly to the community if they think uh, you know, our uh, activities that focus on participation are actually uh, working or, uh, or not. Uh, in the CCM, we do have uh, uh, some reference that we can use uh, uh, to navigate uh, uh, um, our efforts in measuring participation. We can move to the next slides. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Ash. Uh, so first I would mention uh, the degrees of participation, also known as the participation ladder. I think uh, uh, many of you uh, are familiar with this. This example that we have here in the slides is from the management uh, toolkit. There are uh, many different uh, examples existing. Uh, they might have some slight difference, but you know the main uh, the main concept uh, is the same. So um, we have different, uh, we said like we have different uh, type of uh, participation activities, but then. Uh, um, the way community participate in these activities can be different. We can have different levels, different degrees. Um, so uh, there are lower level of participation. So for example, uh, information transfers where you know, community is uh, uh, asked to provide uh, information, but uh, uh, not necessarily this information will uh, uh, affect decision making. Then progressively, the ladders goes up to a higher level uh, of participation, up to, for example, interactive uh, participation, when uh, um, community are actually completely involved in decision maker together with the other partners, with the other, uh, with the other stakeholders. Uh, this, of course, it's a, it's a generalization, but could be useful uh, to evaluate uh, where we really are in terms of participation. So often uh, happens that uh, humanitarian practitioner they you know they talk and talk about uh, about participation, but then if we really look uh, closer, um, often I mean uh, of course not always we engage at the lower level uh, uh, of this participation ladder. For example, information transfer or or consultation. Um, it's a bit less common that uh, we manage uh, to uh, reach a higher level of participation where we really engage community in decision making. Um, then another reference that uh, uh, it is important for us to navigate, uh, you know, the complexity of measuring participation uh, for the CCM practitioner are for sure the CCM standards. So yesterday we just mentioned in the beginning, we had uh, um, a very good session that uh, clearly uh, outlines uh, uh, the importance uh, of the CCM standards for different aspects of our work. And then for sure it's also uh, regarding community participation and uh, measuring uh, participation. One of the pillar of the minimum standards, it's around community participation and representation, but then the um, aspect of uh, um, engagement of community uh, it's mainstream in, in 
uh, all these different uh, standards. So the minimum standard for management uh, offers a, a framework, a structures, offers of course also indicators that can be very helpful uh, when we want to uh, monitor, when we want to evaluate uh, uh, our uh, participatory activities. Um, we can move to the next slide, Ash, thanks. Uh, so we, we said that uh, you know, partici measuring participation is complex. There are different uh, type of activities. There are different aspects, different degrees, uh, different components that we might want to evaluate. And sometimes it's very complicated to evaluate all of them. So uh, as a first step, we might want to um, identify what exactly we want to measure. Uh, we could, for example, measure who participate or who did participate and how effective was uh, their participation. Uh, we uh, might, might want to evaluate if uh, uh, the individual and groups that represent the community are actually uh, um, truly uh, representative of all the different groups in the camp population. Uh, we might want to know if uh, uh, the marginalized group has been involved in the participatory process or activities. Or we, want, or we might uh, want to know if uh, uh, um, which level of, which degrees of participation we have reached uh, through uh, our uh, activities. For some of these uh, uh, questions, we might need to have uh, quantitative data, but uh, very often we might need to have uh, qualitative data, uh, which uh, we know that uh, um, sometimes are more complex uh, uh, to collect. So we are going to uh, keep exploring this key aspect about uh, measuring participation uh, with our speakers. But before doing that, uh, I want just to uh, have a moment to reflect on uh, our challenge in measuring participation. So um, I'm going to ask Christine to help us with this uh, in a few seconds. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, I uh, really encourage to um, share with us uh, in the chat what do you think it's for you, uh, based on your I mean, daily experience, what is for you the main challenge uh, in uh, uh, why, uh, when you are asked to measure participation. So, uh, Kristin, uh, um, she introduced herself before. She is uh, uh, the project manager for the Community Coordination Toolbox. In the last 18, uh, 18 months, I would say 18 years, but it's a bit too much. In the last 18 months, uh, she's been in close contact with CCF practitioners uh, in uh, trying to support them uh, in, uh, um, uh, yeah, in uh, engaging uh, with community in different uh, aspects. So, uh, Kristen, from your uh, uh, yeah, daily contact with uh, uh, CCM practitioner working with the community in the field, what do you think are the main challenge around measuring participation? And, uh, and also, uh, Kristen, if you can highlight uh, um, if there are tools within the community coordination toolbox that actually can be useful in this effort. Okay, um, Giovanna, I will try. Thank you. <laughs> um, um, so one of the challenges that um, that was highlighted during the um, the research that we did last year on engaging the community during a pandemic, it was that uh, the agencies that work in the same location they very often they have very different goals and objectives when it comes to community engagement or community participation. So they define community participation very differently. Um, like you, like Giovanna was referring to the different um, uh, degrees of participation, the different stages of the ladder. Um, some agencies that, that I talked to, they, um, the, their goal was to, uh, when it comes to community participation was to deliver a certain amount of bulk SMS um, with um, uh, COVID information. While other agencies, their community engagement goal was to um, have a certain amount of consultations with the different community groups uh, on, um, uh, on their needs in, in the community and the COVID response. While others, again, in the same location, um, would uh, uh, um, have as a goal you know, how, 
how the consultations actually inputted to and uh, changed or designed the, the COVID response. So it's very different uh, from the different agencies. And I think that until we have a harmonized um, goal or objectives or the definition of community participation, although there is one in the, in the camp management toolkit, it's not used similarly between different agencies. So until there's a harmonized um, uh, definition and goal for community participation, we don't know um, we don't know how to measure it. We don't know what indicators to use because we don't know what indicators to use if we don't know what to measure. Uh, are we supposed to measure quantitative um, uh, participation, like how many consultations, number of meetings, how many SMS have been sent out, or qualitatively how aware are the the community members of the complaints and feedback mechanism or have they actually been listened to and have the, the consultation fed into designing the response. So that's one challenge. And um, another challenge that um, has been raised by many when it comes to um, measuring participation is um, that this is not a priority from their donors. So if this creates two different kind of sets of challenges in a way. One is prior to the program design. So uh, there's a lack of time and resources to measure any baseline, any community participation baseline. We don't know, are they, do they have a fully, fully functioning representation system or not? Are they pleased with their, their uh, participation in the current response or not? And also um, um, to actually uh, engage the community in designing the response, the program that uh, we are looking to implement. And then also related to funding um, is that there's a lack of resources for um, engaging the community during the response, uh, which takes time. As we all know, you, you need to spend a lot of time with the community members to gain their trust and, and to really figure out what they, uh, how they want to participate, etc. And, uh, and to measure their participation levels. Um, specifically, when it comes to qualitative participation, so um, how familiar are they with the CRMs? The, how is their input being used? Are their priorities considered? Are they happy with the, um, the beneficiary selection criteria, etc.? cetera? Um, it's not, because it's not quantifiable, it uh, may not be included in, in your log frame. Um, um, we do have some tools in the community coordination toolbox, um, which is an online repository of tools that um, we collected last year. It's um, NRC's tools for how to engage the community members in, in uh, planning and, and designing um, the humanitarian response. Um, I think, Maybe uh, Ashreen can, can post a link in, in the chat to this uh, toolbox. One tool for measuring the participation of, um, the, of the community members in general, and um, this can be used as a baseline and it can also be used uh, to measure any changes over time. And um, also um, the different levels of participation and influence between the different demographic groups in the, within the community and any changes that are happening among them. Uh, it also is qualitative. So it's asking a lot of questions around um, uh, how they perceive their participation. Um, um, you know, have they been approached by any humanitarian agencies in the last six months? Um, do they feel like they are being listened to? Um, we also have another tool that is focusing specifically on the committees or the community focal points, et cetera, and um, uh, their influence and participation level, which can help agencies that work with the committees in um, measuring any, any increase in impact of their work. So in NRC, we use these two, two tools both to measure um, impact of our and other agencies work on community participation to, to convince donors that this is really working. Um, and also to, of course, um, use 
both baseline midline like several times during programming and endline to to have a chance to to adapt our programming um, based on the feedback and we also used it to develop with the stakeholders um, exist um, our exit strategies so indicators for when we can um, uh, safely exit you know we um, we would agree that we will not exit until participation has reached a certain level um, according to the community members. Um, I think this covers everything I wanted to mention. So I will hand back to Ashreen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kristen, and sharing about the community coordination toolbox. Before we go into our little panel interview that we've planned, um, I would just wanted to mention that we will be sharing in the chat a link to a document that we prepared Essentially, this document basically summarizes the tools that we intend to highlight and uh, speak about today. And also it highlights um, or mentions the uh, tools that Kristen uh, had mentioned before. It also has links to where you can access some of these tools or who you want to contact if you want more information about that. And I also wanted to mention, if you have any questions you would like to ask our panelists, please, please do write it in our chat at any point. Um, we will try and address all of your questions. And I wanted to thank you all for writing your challenges. I've been reading um, a lot of them about, you know, donors, the timeline to establish and how there's not enough time to, for example, do a baseline, the availability of tools, measuring the quality of participation, balancing between qualitative and quantitative, right? So I hope that we will be able to address all your concerns and some of these challenges that you've mentioned through our little uh, interview that we're about to have. Um, so to begin, I, I have a question for all our panelists, um, which is Michelle, Ellie, and Julia. Could you briefly describe the tools that we will be talking about and what ways these tools can be used to measure participation within CCCM. Uh, perhaps, Michelle, you could start um, start off this question. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so I'll start just by giving a little bit of a background to the spider diagram tool uh, or spidergrams. Um, so I should say that I, I don't work in CCCM, um, I work in WASH, uh, so sorry if I every so often slip into saying WASH, um, <laughs> but hopefully the, the tool that I present, in, you'll see that you could use it in lots of different sectors. Um, so essentially, um, hopefully you'll have seen a spider diagram before, so it, essentially it's a central point with then arms that come off and it looks very much like a spider's web. So on each of the arms you can use to uh, allocate a number and then you join those numbers together to give a, a web kind of shape which can, um, can tell you areas where you're doing better and areas where you're not doing so well dependent on how much of the segment is, um, is shaded in. So We've utilized that tool within our WASH programming and um, essentially we've used it as a voting exercise, but really the most important part of it is the discussion that happens around it. So we set up um, different uh, groups called listening groups um, and those groups are um, representative of different sections within a community. So you may have one group of older men, you might have a group of adolescent girls, you might have a group of women who are mothers, etc. So you try to kind of set up different groups that represent different elements within the community that you're working with. Um, and with each of those groups, we had discussions about our WASH programming. So we asked them the things that people liked, that they didn't like, etc. had those discussions. And then we did a voting exercise around different elements of the WASH response. So each leg of the, the spider diagram um, was a different element of our WASH programming. Um, and each member of the group would vote on how well they thought that element was going. So five being with they thought we were doing a fantastic job, zero being we were doing an absolutely terrible job. And then we'd have a discussion around the average of those votes. So where satisfaction was very low, we discussed the reasons why, uh, but we also discussed what the group would like Oxfam to do 
about that. So were there specific pieces of feedback that they wanted us to act on? But we also asked, what, what is it that you can also do? So what are the things that can happen within the community that could also increase that satisfaction there? So we would do those discussions every kind of two to three months but we'd also still be meeting with that group in the meantime. And, and the reason for that is that we wanted to have um, kind of iterative meetings with the same groups of people so that we could discuss changes over time. We could give them an update about um, how we changed based on the feedback that they'd given us. And they could also share with us anything new that was coming up for them. So after a period of around two or three months, we'd go back to doing the spider diagram exercise and we'd look at how the scores had changed. And hopefully the area that we'd highlighted as being the priority previously, where we'd had lower scores, hopefully we'd see an increase in that. But if not, we'd kind of have that discussion as, as to why. Um, and if that had increased, but another section perhaps had decreased, again, we'd have those discussions and, and we'd, um, we'd change what we were doing based on that. So a lot of the feedback that we had coming from those groups is that people appreciated that way of doing it because they could see the changes that were made based on their input and their feedback. And they could also see that it wasn't only Oxfam's responsibility to change the scores, to increase the scores, that it had to be a joint effort between both the community and Oxfam's WASH team. So when we, um, when we checked in with people, that, that was what they liked. They liked being able to see the changes um, um, in, in kind of um, improvements over time. Um, and, and maybe just with that as well, to, to highlight that, Within that, we were measuring participation not only through how the scores changed in terms of people's satisfaction, but we were also, um, the, the qualitative aspect of the discussions was also the very important part of helping us uh, change our programming um, and making sure that we were kind of doing things differently in response to the feedback that we were getting. So in terms of how, you could utilize that tool for CCCM. I mean, it's very easy to swap out the, the kind of uh, the legs of the, the diagram for being um, topics that matter to you or matter to the communities that you're working with. So an initial discussion might be, what do we want those different arms of the diagram to represent? You know, are they, are they going to look at coordination? Are they going to look at services? Are they going to look at different aspects? Um, and setting those together and then measuring them over time together could be a good way of increasing participation, but also having that, that regular space to be able to have those discussions is a good way as well of tracking over time what's changing um, and how communities are also involved in making those changes. Thanks, Michelle. I think that's really interesting, particularly on the spidergram and how I definitely think this could be adapted to CCCM, you know. Um, Ali, I wanted to ask you particularly on the tool that ACTA has been using. Could you explain a bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to. Um, so the tool that is linked in the document that's been shared um, is a program tool. So it's implemented by, by our field teams uh, directly in the communities. Um, so essentially it takes four key steps um, and is targeted at trying to encourage and make inclusive um, community committees. Um, so essentially the four key areas um, is the first, the assessment, uh, which is kind of the bulk of the tool that uh, you'll see linked uh, linked in um, <laughs> the, the two pager that's been shared. Um, so it takes quite a qualitative approach to asking questions to try to gain deeper understanding um, of a baseline of participation already active within the site, um, governance structures that already exist and, and different influences, availability of complaint feedback mechanism and that two-way communication flow, um, and then similarly the inclusiveness of the committees already. Um, so I think with, with this tool it then moves on to help the teams create um, a support system for either already existing community um, committees 
or in support of developing them based on the need and what's kind of highlighted from the community themselves. So filling, filling in those gaps. Uh, the second would be to actually set it up um, based on those conversations uh, and findings, and then we would move to the monitoring and evaluation. Um, and I think what's important about this tool, and I think, um, which will be highlighted by, by the other panelists as well, I think all of these tools um, provide not only a baseline, but a space to then follow up and create a midline and create an end line as well. Because um, it's quite hard to measure something when you don't really know what, what you're starting with. Um, and so I think participation um, can frequently, and I think this was, was highlighted by Giovanna at the beginning, participation is so much more than just a number of certain individuals in a specific group and, and a tick box exercise. Um, for, for lack of a better word. Um, and so using qualitative and quantitative methodologies and trying to combine the two um, right from the beginning of your project, I think supports not just stating to a donor or to your program teams that the activity is completed, but provides real time feedback on, on the relevance and uh, the relevance of your intervention and helps you contextualize it as well um, for, for the teams and the context that you're, you're working in to fill those gaps and, and fill in missing information that you need for meaningful participation from, from the community. I agree with you there. I think, um, especially with CCCM, the contexts are so different and the baseline and the midline. I think this actually links to the women's participation tool. Um, Julia, could you ex explain a bit more about that? So yes, pleasure. Um, so the tool that IOM is, is developing and is still in the process of piloting, so it's a work in progress. I'll be happy to share with you some of the lessons learned that we did, um, that we've gathered from the pilot in South Sudan later on. Um, but just to say that the tool is still kind of being refined and iterated as we go along. Um, so the tool is basically linked to the Women's Participation Project. Um, it's uh, basically aimed at capturing impacts of uh, participants um, uh, engagement with the activities uh, of the Women's Participation Project. Um, it's a quantitative survey. Um, it's again, as mentioned by Ellie, a before and after tool. So a baseline to be implemented before the activities start and an end line after uh, at the activities take place. Um, it captures perceptions of participants on a range of dimensions. Uh, of course, the most traditional ones linked to participation in formal uh, platforms, but also in formal platforms such as decision-making within the household, uh, perceptions around leadership, JBV, safety, um, and the idea is that these perceptions are then compared across time. Um, and I think that one of the good things about this tool is that in addition to also telling us a lot about what happened as a result of the project, the information that is obtained to this tool, uh, through this, this tool and the data that is generated also allows us to, um, to make decisions about programming. And I think that the, the safety data is a good example around how how some of the data that is generated through the use of this tool can help other, other sectors to you know, also uh, make decisions about uh, programming priorities. I see, Over that's really interesting. Thanks, Julia. Thank you, Ellie and Michelle as well for sharing. Um, just to check, I saw that someone said that they can't access the tool, uh, the, the document. I shared a link, to, a link again. Please do try and let me know if it doesn't work and we'll try and address that. Um, Coming back to our little chat about measuring participation, um, especially as now we have a lot more information about the tools that all the different organizations that we are talking with today has. Um, Michelle, from your experience, how can the tools that you work with in Oxfam be effective in bridging the gap between quantitative and qualitative data collection? I can see in the chat that this is also a, a challenge that some of our fellow CCCM practitioners have faced. Over to you. Um, yeah, it, it is a big challenge and it, it is one that we struggle with a lot as well. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of the a lot of the more important information is in the, the qualitative data. And that is the part of the data that I think a lot of practitioners find harder to analyze 
Um, so there's a much more of a reliance on qualitative or converting quantitative, uh, qualitative data rather into quantitative data in some form to be able to kind of um, to do an analysis. Um, mm -hmm. So I guess using a combination of methods is always a good way. So, you know, if we take, for example, the, the spidergrams, um, you quantified some aspects, but actually the, the majority of the information was still qualitative. Um, and then perhaps, you know, another tool that has been shared on the chat as well as our community perception tracker, which is gathering qualitative data, but then can be represented in, in quantitative forms such as graphs and, and changes over time, et cetera, in terms of people's perceptions. Um, so I do think there is there are ways that you can kind of quantify some aspects of qualitative data. Um, but I also think as well, um, it's around kind of investing in your teams and investing in your staff of being able to do that qualitative um, analysis very well. Um, so it does take longer, it does take time, but I think you know, investing in meal teams to be able to do that better is, is the right way to go rather than sort of saying that, oh, we'll, we'll just shift everything into being more quantitative. Um, mm -hmm. I think we need to have a, a broader investment in, in how we analyze qualitative data. Yeah, and this kind of links back to what Ellie mentioned as well, about how a mixed methods approach is something that could be done to kind of bridge this gap. And I also see that um, our colleague Brian mentioned about, you know, perhaps mixing qualitative indicators with quantitative data. Would you agree with something like that as a mixed methods approach? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think that's the way that we've kind of been able to make it work so far. Um, in terms of how we've been kind of measuring the aspects that are difficult to quantify like participation. Mm -hmm. um, I think as well, there needs to be a bit more in encouragement with donors as well to recognize that the, um, you know, the, the devil is not in the numbers, it's more in the detail of what we're hearing from people than, than necessarily seeing a percentage go up or down. Um, mm -hmm. So perhaps that's a, another, another way to kind of bridge that divide a bit more. Yeah, I, I think we all agree with you there for sure. <laughs> um, Sorry, I just, so I just saw that someone has asked what MEAL is um, for, for those that don't know the acronym. So it's it's monitoring, evaluation, accountability and learning. So um, I know different organizations call it different things, but, but uh, monitoring and evaluation essentially. Thanks, Michelle. All right, so going to my next question, um, and I guess I want to ask Julia this, um, does the tool, the women's participation tool that you spoke about, do you think this tool addresses the challenge of capturing qualitative data? Well, I think we're still kind of baby steps. And that's why for me, this conversation has been very insightful because I think that there's a lot that we can learn from what the colleagues have presented. I think that the, the spider web, even though we're, we're working with a different system, but the idea of assigning scores to qualitative things is definitely a good way. Um, to go about it. One of the things that I, I think we need to really focus on as we work on strengthening the tool is to ensure that data is comparable about, across time um, and to create an easy method to standardize and, and make the process of anal analyzing the data more systematic because of course this is a tool that we're piloting in South Sudan but we also want other missions to be able to use it and we want to make the process of using this tool and analyzing the data as smooth as possible for everybody including missions that have high ME capacity and missions that have low ME capacity so um, we still haven't been able to fully crack it but I think that the idea of assigning scores to certain types of perceptions you know whether they are more positive or more negative uh, is one way to go about it um, and we're still kind of working on it. I, I agree with you that definitely is important to know what lies behind the numbers and that is quite critical. And that's why the mixed method approach is for sure something that we wanna be able to invest in. Also, um, you know, fully aware of the caveat that analyzing qualitative data is, 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 might be more challenging, especially if we're talking about an analysis that has to be rigorous and applies the same standards at baseline and end line, right? We, we don't want to use a completely different framework for coding qualitative information at baseline and then at end line. So 
my point is just to say that I think that we're very we're more we're 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 more clear about what needs to happen and we still haven't fully cracked the guidance that needs to be involved in telling people how to go about doing it. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so I think it's a work in progress. And that's why this conversation has been extremely, extremely helpful, because I think that there's a lot that we can build on uh, from the tools that already exist and the coding systems that you use and the markers that you use for, for um, analyzing your information. But it's definitely an area in, in, in progress. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um... Ali, I wanted to ask the same question actually to you, but in your in your experience with the tools from Acted. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I, I am coming less from uh, an AME and assessment side and more from, from the program side. So I will say, I mean, just right off the bat, I'm, I'm always a little bit more interested in the qualitative information that's, that's coming in and maybe not as interested as I need to be in the scientific and, uh, and cross analysis that goes on. Um, but no, I think for me, this tool um, that we're, we're using, and I think we are trying to incorporate this, this qualitative data collection across not just only community committees, but in the other, other programs that we do, because obviously participation across these, these, um, these units is important. Um, obviously, I think it's been highlighted as well that the main challenge with qualitative data that's coming back in is the range of interpretation, depending on who's collecting it, depending on how it's translated. I mean, we're working um, on the Syrian response and so depending on which area it is, it's being translated once, twice, three times before it comes back to you. Um, and so, so ensuring that that information and the tool is developed in a way that it allows for space um, for the, the community and for the people being interviewed or in the focus group discussion to elaborate on, on their experience and their wants, but also structured in a way that there's not too much room, shall we say, for, for people to interpret and, and put in their own bias in what's being collected back. So I think um, it's a struggle that I don't think we've quite perfected and, and quite cracked as, as Julia was saying, but it's, it's I think, a step closer to trying to, to create a space that we can better engage and measure participation. Um, and I think qualitative data as well, obviously, it just provides that, that needed and necessary information, especially in CCCM, which is very people-centered, which is the whole, whole purpose of today. Um, to have deeper understanding about how things work um, with this specific tool as well. We obviously try to target different groups of individuals at different times, um, different seasons, whatever it may be. And I think using that as well, almost substituting out the, the who, what, why, and when across these different groups also really helps triangulate how the experience in this site differs and how you can engage. So what participation currently looks like and what it could could look like by by asking these questions. Yeah, thanks, Ali. I mean, I think from what Julia and you have said, I think a really important part is also adaptability of the tool. That's what I, I understood as well, right? And I can making sure that these tools can be adapted to the local context and to the cultural, like the cultural aspects of the different areas that we work in. And um, Coming more specific into that, I mean, we know that there are different degrees of participation within CCCM, for example, within the household, within the community level. And I guess I'm not gonna ask you again, Ali. <laughs> um, so in your opinion, like, how can we measure the different degrees of participation within CCCM? Well, I think you bridged that actually perfectly for, for the answer that I wanna give. I mean, I think, uh, and, and Kristen, you also said this at the beginning, talking about uh, NRC's tools, um, defining participation is, is still a struggle in a lot of the places that we are. So I think one of the first steps that we need to look at as CCCM practitioners is, is what do the communities define as participation across the board, not just in um, their, their representation in committees, but across, across all these different activities. I mean, um, certainly having the CCCM minimum standards that we discussed yesterday, and I'm sure will be brought up plenty uh, over the next few days is a great guidance to, to fall back on and will help to harmonize this sector. Similarly, my experience currently, I mean, ACT is working on a pilot project that spans seven countries for CCCM. So we do have a toolkit of these standardized tools. However, 
contextualization and adaptability to where you are working is absolutely crucial. I mean, between a site a few kilometers down the road, you might have to adapt it, let alone a whole different context. And so really ensuring that the definition and the wants and the opportunities of participation coming from the community are, are something that you're engaging in and, and supporting kind of from the, from the onset of your project and implementation. Thanks, Ali. Um, Julie, I wanted to ask you with, within, within the context of South Sudan and with the tool that we're talking about as well, um, what do you think? Do you think it can measure the different levels of participation there? Um, I, yeah, I think Ellie provided a very comprehensive response. <laughs> I will try to see what I can complement there because I completely second her thoughts on, on everything. I think that the idea of ensuring that what is defined as participation is comes from the community is, of course, absolutely key and central to this. Um, what I think is interesting is that the IOM tool um, looks at leadership, perceptions of safety, GDV. And even though we have these different, like the, these pillars of things that we want to see reflected in the tool, what goes under each question can be highly adaptable. So we can play around with that depending on what we think is more relevant for the community. So it's it allows us some flexibility to build uh, on what are the community perceptions and what we want to see reflected in the tool, but we still have some pillars of things that we, we want to see captured in the tool. So that allows us to play a bit. So this is, I mean, in, in addition to what Ellie said, this is what I feel like in compliment, because I think her, her answer was pretty comprehensive and pretty much, you know, reflects my own thoughts on, on this. But uh, but yeah, so just to say that the tool itself gives us flexibility to adapt, but but uh, also within certain parameters of things that we want to see reflected, because it is very challenging. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree with both of you there. Um, Giovanna, did you want to say something? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to uh, ask you, do I like what is coming uh, from the chat? Uh, so Fernanda, she's a... Uh, um, reminding us that our existing uh, uh, she's sharing a tool actually on indicators from the chs alliance on commitment four and five so there is the link in the chat uh, and then uh, Ash, there is a, there was a question from kristin that i think uh, hmm. if Kristin wants to elaborate further for uh, some of the the speakers one the speaker Sure, yeah, I'm, I can read out the question. I'm just seeing it now. So Kristen, you asked how to make the indicators for successful participation is relevant for the community. Could you expand a bit more on that? Yeah, I mean, I asked the question before Ellie and Julia oh. <laughs> um, um, talked about the same. Uh, so uh, it's, um, they, they pretty much answered the questions uh, very well, but uh, just it's, I was curious how others were making sure that the indicators for participation were not set by us, whether that's an extension of the donors or not, us as in humanitarian agencies, uh, or if they were able to actually um, include the, the community members in creating indicators for, yeah, uh, I think that, that would be fantastic. <laughs> and I, I completely second your thought on the issue of donor education. I think that a huge part of this needs to come from educating donors on what community perceptions of participation are and not what you know they want to see reflected in a number or an indicator in their log frame or whatever. Yeah, for sure. And, and I think qualitative data can be super helpful in that. I've been sort of pushing for for more, more of those success stories type, type snapshots that we can share with donors to show, highlight some of these experience of, of participation beyond just like reporting numbers. I think that that's one way to go about it. Also because donors love success stories, but, <laughs> but not because we want to promote success stories, but because we want to show them how people understand participation differently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Um, Michelle, do you want to add on on that or you have your hand raised? <laughs> Yeah, I just I was just gonna add on to that and, and maybe something I missed a little bit in that question on on kind of bridging that divide between the different types of data, but also encouraging data uh, encouraging donors to ask for evidence of adaptation. So evidence of where you have done consultation, evidence of where that has brought about a change, evidence of you know defining participation, evidence of 
you know, taking cultural or contextual context, you know, into account in your programming. So, you know, perhaps educating donors that they can also get results that way as well by mm -hmm. asking um, for provision of evidence rather than just provision of numbers. Yeah, for sure. Thank you uh, for that. Um, I wanted to ask actually um, a question to Ellie, and I think this is kind of related to one of the questions put in the chat by Maxine, but this is more specifically on like groups at risk that we of course work with, for example, persons with disabilities. And in your experience, what are the specific considerations that we need to look into when measuring participation for these groups? And what are the kind of challenges you have faced for engaging or in making sure that persons with disabilities or other groups at risk uh, who are some, who may be excluded from you know, data collection or CCCM activities, what are the challenges you have faced in ensuring that they have been included and particularly for measuring participation? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think I'll probably speak more to the challenges at the, at the moment than, than rather the success stories, unfortunately. Um, I mean, with, within the Syrian response, a report has just recently come out that I believe it's over 80% of households in camp and camp like settings have at least one family member that um, is considered to be a person with disabilities. However, when you compare that to the actual data set that is being collected uh, and registration of, of uh, these people in camps, um, it, it doesn't match. <laughs> and so mm -hmm. clearly there was a disconnect right from the get-go of, of what's being recorded by a, a more protection-based and trained um, organization and partners, um, and then the data coming in. So I think we had to take a step back and kind of course correct, I mean, as camp management agencies, if we don't know who or where these people are, how are we meant to advocate, encourage, and support their participation, let alone measure it? So for us, um, we kind of saw this as, as a gap. And I mean, it wasn't just camp management, it was a little bit across the board within the response, mm -hmm. unfortunately. And so we took a step back and paired with um, a protection partner. And our first um, kind of area was to better um, educate and coach um, those key partners and, and units so the registration unit um, on what a rights-based approach to disability looks like. And so we used the Washington short set and kind of updated a lot of our short set of questions, sorry, um, and updated a lot of our registration um, and, and information gathering tools. And similarly did um, a little bit of re-education away from the medical terminology of disabilities um, and kind of emphasized and reinterpreted that an impairment is not just an impairment, but it's the barriers that block impairments in the site are actually where participation, that's where that gap is. And I think by doing this, it kind of was the first step to change the way that camp management agencies were, were engaging with these people. And so we were, <laughs> we're now in the process of kind of re -cor uh, correcting this process. Um, and I mean, I think, it's something that needs time on. It kind of goes back to that conversation of, of donor engagement and, and how we how we advocate for these processes. But um, it was taking one step even back from just our measuring and assessment tools and just making sure that we were collecting the data to begin with and that we had the tools to, to do that. And now that that's done, we can start looking forward in our in our second year of, of the program to better incorporate and in, ensure inclusion in our different activities. Thanks, Ellie. And I like, I mean, I think this is a, a challenge that a lot of us face, um, ensuring that persons with disabilities are included in programming. This is something that I, I know from working with Women's Participation Project, it's something that we've also encountered in terms of, our, you know, tools and ensuring to adapt. I like that you mentioned that, you know, you working with specialized organizations to ensure that, you know, that your tools are actually applicable to this. I think that's something that's really important because for example, we're, we're all not um, expertise in this, but we need to ensure that we are including the people. This includes local organizations as well that have these expertise and that can advise us on how to best approach it, right? I just wanted to expand a bit more on one of our conversations that we had. I, I think you mentioned that you had used the community coordination toolbox in your context, Ellie, um, in Syria. And I just wanted to ask, 
has the, you know, what was your experience using the toolbox, um, the, the NRC toolbox that Kristen mentioned? And um, particularly as, you know, um, you had mentioned that in Syria, you have had to adapt to a remote and mobile approach. Uh, so I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we had the pleasure of actually sending one of our, our staff to participate in the in the TOT that was done a few months ago. So that was wonderful to have that resource um, in house afterwards. Um, and so I think, I mean, as you mentioned, um, there's quite a mix of, of methodologies being used in this response, particularly. So we have remote, we have static, we have mobile, we have semi static, you add on top of that, that COVID um, has been taking place and adds another layer of remoteness. You add on top of that, that CCCM is a relatively new sector, even though the response in Syria has been going on for quite a while. And so um, kind of understanding and expertise on the ground uh, are, are, might not be where they are in other responses. Um, and so I can't say that we've used the whole toolbox, but having that online resource that's already translated that has these guidance notes was an incredible and still remains an incredible resource to kind of fall back on and use as a roadmap with um, often teams and project managers that are in different locations, different time zones, speaking different languages. Um, so it's just an incredible resource. I highly encourage anybody that has not gone to check it out to, to take a look. Um, I think my personal uh, favorite tool was definitely the social and cultural influence analysis. I think it highlights a lot of what we have been <laughs> Kristen, sorry. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it highlights a lot of what we've discussed here today and I mean the use of qualitative data and also looking at those more vulnerable or maybe excluded groups um, and not just looking at their vulnerabilities but looking at what the value that they do bring and that they already bring to the community I think is so fantastic and really highlighting that value um, of how they can participate and how they really already are participating, but just formalizing that process. Um, so yeah, no, it's been a it's been an absolutely invaluable resource. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> That's great to hear. I'm sure Kristen and Gio Romana are really happy to hear about that as well. Kind of, I guess, related to that, um, I saw that in the chat we have a question from Maxine, to, um, which was about. How do you build on lessons learned and maintain a consistent people-centered approach amidst the changing project objectives? And I wanted to kind of throw this question out with our panelists. Um, do any of you have any ideas or would like to respond to this question? No? <laughs> um, I think maybe I'm kind of... oh, sorry, maybe I could start. I think. I think a lot of it is around maintaining dialogue with different groups in your community. So I have building up trust to have that two way feedback happening on a regular basis um, and also building up that trust as well that when there is a change, when there is new feedback coming up, that there will be a difference in, in how you adapt your project and, and your programming as well. So, you know, if that's if that's how you're kind of approaching communities to start with then hopefully that should encourage more feedback, more consultation, et cetera. And you should have a more adaptable program going forward. Um, but I think it all boils down to, you know, making sure you have those regular opportunities to have open dialogue with, um, with the communities that you're working with and different groups within those communities that are kind of open agenda so not going into those thinking oh well, we need to find out this this and this but you know having that as a more open agenda and taking more time to listen to what communities are saying rather than being directive about what you want to hear mm -hmm. yeah thanks michelle and I, on that point as well i think it relates back to what we were talking about earlier about you know having this baseline and midline and endline surveys because that really helps in informing the programming and you're actually involving the community as well. And while talking about that, I do want to highlight that the Women's Participation Toolkit, which is available on the Women Displacement Platform, if you sign up, you can access the tools there where you know the tools for the baseline and the endline are similar because that is an easier way to measure the impact that we have or the consultations through the, through the consultations with the communities as well. So I just wanted to highlight that in relation to Michelle's point as well. Um, 
I wanted to ask Christian because since we were talking about the community uh, coordination toolbox and um, I mean I've seen the toolbox as well I think it's a great resource there's some really amazing tools in there and how do you see this toolbox expanding over the few years or how do you see it evolving particularly with monitoring and evaluation tools thanks um we um we will be um i mean this is a, um um it's a real life website so it's it's like a living document in a way <laughs> So um, we will be changing it based on needs um, um, continually as you know, whenever, um, whenever agencies and communities need us to. So uh, we're testing some new tools currently um, and we will do a bit of a restructuring in October and we will add a, a chapter or a tab on, on m and &E tools and um, hopefully also some, some um, like best practices or lessons learned, for example, on how to um, um, I don't know, different case studies, um, for example, from COVID responses. So uh, also on how to um, um, consider participatory M&E, um, 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 uh, maybe something uh, something more from um, from this conversation, from this discussion, um, there's a lot of things that uh, I've taken note of here that uh, I want to follow up on. Um, I don't know if you want to add anything, Joanna. Uh, no, I think uh, to today, as you mentioned, there is a lot of uh, yeah, a lot of inspiration, and it's also uh, good to see how um, practitioners, you know, working in different contexts. Uh, in different uh, agency, maybe even in different sectors, uh, you know, some uh, challenges, some issues remain the same, uh, but also how we develop, you know, different tools and strategy to try to overcome. Uh, but in the same time, also acknowledge that uh, you know, this specific aspect of measuring participation is uh, a domain where we all, uh, you know, need to work uh, more on. Uh, so there is, uh, yeah. Uh, progress to do there, but uh, yeah, extremely interesting to see uh, so many um, yeah, uh, practice and uh, and uh, inspiration. Sorry, I I know I dropped off for a second. I don't know why my internet just kind of disappeared, and I really apologize for that. Um, no uh, worries, okay. nobody. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Should have just kept going. <laughs> Um, okay, so continuing on now, I just wanted to remind uh, all the participants, please feel free to write any questions. I love to see, I love that I'm seeing that all of you are having a discussion in there. Um, I think um, Ash, it's yeah, again. It's like the big freeze, Giovanna. I think you might need to jump yeah. in here and carry on. Yeah, no worries. Uh, Amarachi, because in the meantime, my my chat it got blocked, so I cannot see any more the chat. Do we have any questions from the uh, uh, from the participant? No, I think our participants are hoping to have a dialogue within themselves to talk about the participation of the experience. about with Michelle. So I think we should move to the next stage where we have the dialogue within the chat. Hi, can you guys hear me? Sorry, I dropped uh, again. We're just uh, checking, uh, uh, you know, how it's if there were any questions for the speakers from the chat. Yeah, I was actually talking about that when I dropped. I was just saying that I love that I'm seeing uh, some dynamic conversations going on right now, and that's really great. Um, I actually have a question for Michelle, um, and it's particularly on you know the tools that are being developed on community engagement and you shared some really interesting tools so i wanted to ask like could you explain the process of how these tools were formulated to ensure that you know measuring participation and community engagement is engaged is included and how how to ensure that these tools are effective and ensuring that the ethics and safety mechanisms are considered and implemented into these tools as well 
Yeah, I think I think it goes a lot back to what uh, the other panelists were saying around contextualizing um, the different tools. So where we have built up tools in the past and, and we have used kind of different approaches work for different responses. Um, but we, we've spent time kind of contextualizing those and, and piloting them um, and piloting them with, I'd say, kind of, you know, in quote marks, safe groups. So, you know, we work quite a lot with community volunteers who kind of have a, a, a kind of greater understanding of, of Oxfam's programming. So quite often we will pilot um, different tools with, with those groups and ask them for more honest feedback about whether it would work in the community um, and their thoughts on it uh, before kind of taking it much broader. Um, and quite often we, we, with any new tool, we would start using it in a very small way, first of all. And, and my previous manager always used to say small is beautiful until we get it right and then making it bigger. Um, so certainly that was kind of the approach that we would take in terms of either formulating a new, a new tool or contextualizing it. But then um, in terms of kind of the ethics and making sure we're keeping things safe, um, so with that, of course, there's a lot of staff training for the for the teams who are going to facilitate the different um, tools. But I think mm -hmm. one of the big things is around making sure that teams are aware of different referral mechanisms. And um, because quite often what does come up is when when you are having those regular conversations and building up that trust, then people do. Um, you know, feel more open to talk about perhaps more sensitive issues and perhaps things that um, that might not come up in more structured discussions. So making sure that the teams that are doing the facilitation have a really good understanding of different services that are available and are able to refer in the correct way is really, really important with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and like related to that, I think I wanted to touch on when you mentioned staff training. So, I mean, when you I'm thinking about, you know, code of conduct and like terms of reference. I think this is also related to the active tool that um, Ellie had shared with us as well. I mean, in my opinion, this is something really important as well. So is this something that's involved in the training as well? Like ensuring that the staff understands the different codes of conduct and the safety mechanisms there? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think it's something that more often, um, in our, in our programs more recently, um, particularly it comes in a lot into recruitment as well. So in the past, I think we always used to look for, you know, public health or perhaps community mobilization as a background that we were looking for within our, um, within our public health promotion teams. Um, but more and more now, I think we're leaning more towards a certain skill set, and that skill set being around the ability to to listen well, to kind of have that um, rapport building with communities. So it's less around kind of the, the technical knowledge, which we can support that person in building up that technical knowledge around, you know, for us kind of different um, wash related diseases and things like that. But it's more about the skill that that individual has uh, and the rapport that they're able to build. Um, and that's kind of the focus that you know, we, we tend to bring in even at recruitment phase because that's quite hard to teach. Um, mm -hmm. and, and it can be very hard to teach when people have a strong technical background because you feel like you should have the answers. You feel like mm -hmm. you should know. Um, whereas really what we want is members of staff who feel comfortable saying, I don't know the answer to that. Let's try and figure out a solution together. So um, yeah, it's kind of looking at even the recruitment process before you even get into the, the training. And we, we say a lot with our teams, like take off your technical glasses. So you're, you're not working for Oxfam anymore. You're not an engineer anymore. You're just a person having a conversation with another person um, and think of it that way. So in our training, mm -hmm. we try to rely on that quite a lot. Yeah, I like what, you know, like you said, you know, listening is so important and being able to open up that dialogue, right? Um, I have a question for Julia, actually, about the, the tool, the women's participation tool. So could you explain a bit more about the process it has been with developing and adapting the tool with the teams in South Sudan as well? Sure. So um, the tool uh, basically that we're working with right now is a sort of a 
updated version of a tool that I think the South Sudan had already developed and that IOM HQ picked up and, and sort of expanded on. And the tool is largely uh, based on the uh, Women's Empowerment Index. Um, so it contains some sort of features that were taken from that. Um, again, the issue of strong effort in contextualizing the tool, I think that the South Sudan team is pretty much like very much um, aware of the context in which they are operating. So this allowed us to really dive into what needed to be changed, uh, what wasn't really appropriate. Um, and then the baseline, which we did a couple of months ago, also provided us with a good amount of lessons learned uh, because as Michelle mentioned, like the enumerators and the people that are actually applying the tool then came, came back with a lot of very good information uh, in terms of how some of the questions really weren't understood, how some of the questions were not really, you know, taken as appropriate uh, by, by the respondents. I mean, they felt a bit culturally insensitive <laughs> even, but, uh, but um, so these are, you know, good feedback that of course uh, we will definitely incorporate in the next iteration of the tool. And thinking about the, the point that Michelle said about small is, is is good is small is beautiful i don't i don't remember exactly what was the adjective that she used but something along those lines what we're considering doing now uh, for the end line is to split the group and have one group responding to the same version of the questionnaire just to give us a bit of like uh, information for us to be able to compare but the second group will respond to the iterated version of the questionnaire which already addresses some of the lessons learned of the of the baseline so that also allows us to test again the tool to see if the the new tool is more appropriate and and better understood just to say that the issues with translation are also enormous, right? Um, and in interpretation of the tool as well, um, where South Sudan is a context where we're working with people with very low schooling and literacy levels. So that idea that answers have to fit into the answer options that we give is also an alien concept um, in contexts where people are used to talking and not necessarily saying, well, yes, no, not applicable, I don't know. Um, so this is also something that we're working on improving to making sure that whenever we give them answer options, they best capture what it is that they are trying to say in a kind of mm -hmm. long narrative answer. Uh, but yeah, I think that the issue of contextualization is really important. And then the issue of training of enumerators, absolutely. We cannot forget that we're talking to a group of 30 women. So of course, that might be disclosures of sensitive information. Uh, the fact that enumerators were women, I think, is something that is very important to highlight. I think that in a lot of contexts, we have, we might face some issues of hiring women enumerators, but that's an effort that we really need to make uh, because mm -hmm. some of these issues are quite uh, sensitive, and the idea that they're talking to someone of the same gender group is really critical. Um, the fact that enumerators might might need to have uh, previous training on, you know, how to safely handle GBV and SEA referrals and all these things, I think is absolutely critical. So yes, I completely agree with Michelle that, that soft skills um, are absolutely vital. And then building all the technical, you know, um, skills is something that we can definitely do, but the soft skills, either you have it or you don't. So it's good to have people with, with that profile, absolutely. Yeah, thanks, Julie. I mean, that's so that's so true. And like what Michelle said, and you said as well, small is beautiful. Um, so I want to kind of um, conclude our session because I'm taking note of our time as well. So um, one important question I feel I need to ask all of you is because we've been talking so much about you know donor relations and and having longer term programming. So for the panelists to conclude our little interview how do we advocate for longer term programming and how do we advocate for the importance on qualitative data collection with our donors, in your opinion? Um, Michelle, would you like to start? I can try. <laughs> um, I mean, coming from kind of outside of CCCM, I mean, it, it's kind of reassuring to hear people saying the same thing as well. So. I wonder whether some of it is a kind of a collective push across different mm -hmm. sectors back to donors around, you know, we can do so much more impactful work that is, it, well, is more sustainable, is more responsive, 
if we have longer time frames in which we can kind of respond to changing in con changing context, changing feedback coming from communities. Um, so maybe it's kind of a, a more cross sectoral cross sectoral push um, with donors as well. Um, but I also kind of I do I do see some positive changes happening. I do see different owners, uh, different uh, donors looking for, you know, aspects of community engagement within proposal writing. And I think we just need to kind of keep encouraging that trend to happen. Thanks, Michelle. Ellie and Julia, do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, uh, definitely. I mean, I think, um, it was quite eloquently stated as well yesterday when we were going over the camp management uh, standard that will be produced uh, quite soon um, by, I want to say Phil, apologies if I'm getting that name wrong, uh, from the donor perspective. And I think quite often CCCM is hard to define and, and hard to, to quantify as well. Um, and so having this standard toolkit and with the hopes of kind of incorporating it into sphere standards that will also help push this conversation of, of what the expectations um, of participation looks like and and how the different ways we can we we can collect this information and so even just looking at um, at the the toolkit um, that's produced already, it changes some of the indicators for participation. Instead of just asking how many women are on a committee, it, it asks how they feel um, they are incorporated into decision making. And so making that switch in these formal documents, I think is obviously going to, to help with that. I think using key examples from a few donors that are doing longer term projects. Again, I know I've mentioned it earlier, but uh, with, with ECHO, we're doing a three year pilot project. And so it gives us that opportunity to take lessons learned, not just across our own countries that we're working in from year to year, but across a number of different countries. And so looking at the example of persons with disabilities that I brought up before, I mean, being able to recognize that missing piece and then course correct our subsequent tools afterwards, it's going to take time. A year, even six months is, is not going to be enough to, to do that. And so I think participation and therefore how we measure it must it has to go beyond just a voice. Um, and it's that ladder that we talked about, you know, moving from passive to actually, um, why can't I, uh, participant. Um, and so encouraging and supporting um, to make sure that they're heard in matters about their own circumstances and, and are proactive in the response takes time. And so implementing changes from our programs to be able to do that takes even longer. So I think, using both of like success stories from from organization or from donors that already are and then using the the standards to help push that conversation i think will will be key in the the coming years thanks ali yeah um julia do you do you want to input anything for this question yeah, uh, just one one final thought and this is from a very m e perspective i think that the reason why we do m e basically is to learn, right? We're not doing this to ace everything and tell our donors how we did a fantastic job, even though, of course, we want to do a fantastic job. But I think that the more we try to figure out ways to measure participation, the better we understand what participation is. And, and I think that for me, that is a driver. Um, and this is really what motivates me to, to sort of work, you know, continue to improve tools and iterate and develop methodologies. I think that measuring participation is a way of really understanding what participation is and how it's context specific and how it can mean different things to different people and how we can refine our methodologies and tools to, to better reflect what it means to different people in different contexts. So this is it. And I hope our donors understand that. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, thanks, Julie. I mean, I also want to kind of touch on what Michelle said in the point of, you know, a cross sectorial advocacy and, you know, how we need to work together. And I, I think, I think today's conversation really shows how important that is because, I mean, not all of us are from CCCM. We have WASH actors such as Michelle. We have Julia, who's an ME expert, and we have Ellie, who's worked in CCCM. And, hearing that we all have similar challenges and ways of advocating for longer term programming together it's it's really um inspiring to hear in in the sense of you know i think these are ways forward that we can work together to ensure that we can measure participation in a more effective way um 
so as we are kind of going into our closing time, I'm gonna say a few closing remarks. First of all, I want to thank the panelists so much for agreeing to join us today and for sharing your expertise. It's been a wonderful conversation that we've had. As we've heard today, you know, participatory methods to evaluations and measuring participations shows that the degree of ownership by the com community ultimately contributes to greater transparency in programming and in ensuring accountability to the affected populations. And we can see that measuring participation and participatory approaches to m &E has several benefits, such as identifying more locally relevant evaluation methods or questions, building the capacity, sustaining organizational learning and growth, and a very important part is developing the local capacities within the community. And from our discussion today, I think there are three main takeaways I would really like to highlight. First of all is how we need to do more donor education and advocacy there for longer term programming and for the importance of qualitative data. I think a very important point that was highlighted by all our speakers was about the adaptability of tools and about how it's so important to contextualize and to have the participation of local communities and local um, organizations in adapting the tools. And finally, about how listening and opening a dialogue, doesn't matter with who, with your staff, with your community, how important that is in opening up the conversation and actually finding out where we can improve more and how we can adapt more. Um, so lastly, again, I, we would like to thank all of you for taking the time to attend today's session. Um, huge thank you to the speakers again, to Kristen as well for sharing your experience with the Community Coordination Toolbox. That was really interesting. Um, and I also want to add, if we did not answer any questions or any particular uh, queries that you have, please do go to our participation displacement website, which is part of the CCCM cluster website. Uh, it was just shared in the, in the chat. Uh, you can find our email there, send us an email if you have any queries, if you want to engage with the working group. Um, yeah, please do feel free to contact us and please do look at the tool, um, the tool document that I shared, that, that we shared, sorry, because you know there's more information there and there's also links to where you can, um, where you can find the tools or who to engage with if you want to know more about the tools. Um, so to conclude our session, I think it's important for us to remember who we are working with and why we are doing what we're doing. We have a beautiful video from women leaders around the world talking about what participation means to them. So over to you, Alistair. Kebgalka, wuxuumihi mu yahay waxaan ka bartay in wacyigelinta bulshada noocyada kala duwan qofsiga tayadorka nadaafadda iyo kala sigashada COVID-19 waxa kale oo uu fursad ii siiyay in aan fariisto miisaska shirarka ee looga hadlayo arrimaha masiirka ee barakacayaasha mashallah marka waa faa'iido wanaagsan ayaan ka dhaxalnay ka qaybgalka ملاي <تصفيق> شرركة أنا يتو صدق ما لراي ولا لقطلة ضو أي تينك أو كام كا ما لراي سو طالك كلنا وقيف أنا ما شاء الله ما لراي سو سلسا. بنا تسلان ده كسونا ده إنتان نزلنا ما نزل لكن ده إنتان. ما رازية بانغلاش تايره ما نكي يشون ده غريسة هرالو يرا هرا رازية سما شريجن تو هرا ما نكي أومين تومين تقولي هيرا تدين ديارا هرا هم نزلنا ما هرا نزل لكن جاني رهون هرا تو أجي ما نكي سان ديا ويتو. So surat itu juga, surat itu juga sangat dia hutan tip dia hutan, hati hati dia nak hor. Anak hamil juga, anak dos tu dibayar. 
তারা দিবার অনর পরে হন আর আর গরত কুয়াসা আছে দেই তারা না আরা শিখা পাইজি এই জিবি বলি হই রা অনলাইন গরি ওরে জিবি গরে দেই বাইও জানি ইবো মানে কি মায়া মন্দরে শিয়া দি তে হন আগে ডল লাগি তো গত নন এলিতাম এলে শান্তি দিয়া মাঝে মিটিং ও তাই এ হন ইম্মত আ গিও এ হন শাহ হজবারি দিয়া হন আর তেছ নন লাগে My contribution is to teach women what is right and wrong. I go from house to house to sensitize them on environmental hygiene, personal hygiene such as washing the hands of their children before and after eating. Wash their clothes and bathing them. Afterward, I used to carry out fire sensitization awareness, telling women to stop cooking in their shelters because it is not right. it can cause fires and pollute the environment as part of our contribution we also made face masks which is distributed to the camp residents the distribution covers everyone men and women young and old to prevent them from contracting the corona virus in addition we also carried out awareness on self care against corona virus educating women and children on the dangers of the virus our people living with disability they are now included in their activities as iom has provided them with sewing machine which they propel and they are now doing their business now whenever there is any distribution they are the first to be considered before any other person this include distribution of food token